Well, today we start our first day of our um, Scandinavian tour and we're here in Denmark, Copenhagen, and um, which is part of Scandinavia, which is Norway, Sweden and um, Denmark. And we've come to see the beautiful sights of Copenhagen. Copenhagen's made up of a whole lot of islands, so it's set on canals and it's famous for the lovely uh, coloured buildings. And this is the harbour and uh, you can see over there the uh, wind farm and that's uh, in the middle of the harbour, in the middle of the sea, which is something I haven't ever seen before. Very nice. Down there's a little mermaid because the mermaid is the symbol of Denmark. And um, that comes from Hans Christian Andersen who came here and there's normally a mermaid out here. But unfortunately it's been taken to the Shanghai Expo and so they've got this screen which shows it live. But it's made in China so it isn't actually going properly at the moment. And there's what she looks like. And when I was a little child, before I understood the naming patterns, I used to believe that Hans Christian Andersen was a relative of mine. And um, he, of course, he is the one that wrote the story about the Little Mermaid. He came from Denmark, not Norway, but that's just a little minor thing. <laughs> he even child. wrote his stories here in Copenhagen. He did write his stories in Copenhagen. And this is the actual building where Hans Christian Andersen wrote some of his stories. This is the Amelia Borg Palace where the royal family lives. The current queen is called Queen Margarita and her son is called um, Prince Frederick and he married an Australian called Mary. And uh, everybody was very excited so um, she will be the future queen. And this is the Christiansborg Palace which is the site of parliament for Denmark. Now we're going into Tivoli Gardens, which is Copenhagen's main tourist attraction. This place is a bit like a Danish Disneyland because there's rides and lovely lakes and um, lots of food and shows. Nice place. Children are the same in any country, any language. And they call this fun. And there's Hans Christian Andersen everywhere. This place is a fairy tale journey of um, Hans Christian Andersen characters. And here we have uh, Hans Christian Andersen's Mermaid. This is a backup copy for the one that's um, currently in uh, China. Well, the uh, Tivoli Gardens have certainly got lots to do for children. Not so much to do for adults though, but a nice place. We're pleased we got the opportunity to come to Copenhagen. It's a lovely place to visit and um, we're quite impressed with how orderly it is and uh, just the nice ambiance that it has. It's such a great place. Well, we're now saying goodbye to Denmark and we're heading off to Sweden. Scandinavian ferry going across from uh, Denmark to Sweden and it's just about 20 minutes. We're at Lake Vatern which is in the uh, middle of uh, Sweden and you can see it's uh, pretty much like a resort today. Beautiful weather, warm, 
and lots of people enjoying the sunshine. Sweden is the fifth biggest country in Europe and it's mostly covered in trees but it has beautiful lakes and we're down at the lake today and it's a school holiday so they've just started so there's kids everywhere enjoying the, um, the fresh lake or they can swim up in a swimming pool just on the top there. Welcome to Stockholm and this is the city hall where they give out the uh, Nobel prizes and this is the blue room which isn't actually blue it's made of bricks where they actually give out the Nobel prizes and also where they held the reception for the royal wedding a couple of weeks ago and this is the gold room which contains mosaics showing all sorts of um, important events in history, especially Swedish history. For example, this guy created a Wasa sailing ship which went straight into the water and sank, and reflections of various battles that have occurred. Stockholm's a really pretty place. It's uh, set on this lovely lake which actually used to be a, a fjord, but uh, it's gradually got filled in and so now it's a freshwater lake. And the hordes of people are out today because it's holidays. Over there's the old city of Stockholm. And the water we see here is um, from the fjord and a little lock there that leads into the lake. very popular tourist destination especially in summertime. This is the church where the uh, big wedding took place a couple of weeks ago where the princess married her personal trainer and here's the royal palace where the king and queen live. Here's the changing of the guard at the royal palace Stockholm's built on little islands and um, here we, you can see the parliament building that's actually on one of the islands by the old uh, town. Here we have the lock. Well, I've enjoyed Stockholm. It's a lot more energy and a lot more people than Copenhagen. But again, it's got a lovely ambience to it. Lots of old buildings, all built around the uh, sea and around the lake. A really nice place to come to. Go Sweden. Now we're going on the ferry to Finland. And it's an overnight ferry with some beautiful scenery along the way. So we say farewell to Stockholm. Beautiful bays, lots of islands. Yes, it's all rather idyllic. And so we say, welcome to Finland. We're in Helsinki, the capital of Finland, and one of their favourite sons is Sibelius, the composer, and this is a memorial to him, sort of like a pipe organ, and there he is over there, and of course, Sibelius wrote the music Finlandia. Most of his music was written for the piano and for the violin, and not actually much for the organ that caused such a stir in this community that they commissioned a bust of the man so that um, it... Honoured him properly, Honored really. Him properly, yeah. <laughs> Paavo Nurmi is one of Finland's most famous sons. He's a long distance runner, won nine Olympic golds. And here we have the uh, 1952 Olympic Stadium. Now we're in Senate Square, and this area of the old city reflects its Russian heritage. Up there is Tsar Alexander because Russia ruled this country for many years. 
There we have the Lutheran Cathedral. Very imposing. This is City Hall and we're in Market Square in Helsinki and it's all happening here. Lots and lots of people. Helsinki's on the Baltic Sea and you wouldn't think so today but for three months it's actually frozen over. Whereas today it's just beautiful, it's warm and there are tourists everywhere. Well we're eating in the local market and we have paella which has a lot of fish and shrimp and fish, uh, all sorts of yummies and goodies and these meatballs are reindeer. Don't tell Rudolph but we're going to eat him. <laughs> Actually we saw Santa Claus here just yeah, before we did. too. We did. So from Finland. Yeah. <laughs> One of the specialties here is strawberries. And they are sweet as sweet, and made even sweeter by thinking about our friends back home who are in the cold southerly of Wellington. Well, we eat strawberries. We gorge on strawberries, and they're so sweet. Did I say that? 20 hours of Finnish sunshine makes our strawberries extremely sweet. You won't find strawberries like this anywhere in the world. Even the Swedish one sucks <laughs> Finland's had a very checkered history. Back in the 1100s, King Eric from Sweden came over here and Christianized the country and it was under Swedish rule for uh, 650 years. Then the Russians took over because Russia is right next door. And then with the fall of Russia and the Russian Revolution, Sweden declared itself to be an independent country, but it's always had troubles. For a start, it doesn't really like Sweden, with all that memory of those years. But also, in the Second World War, it tried to be neutral, but it couldn't be. And uh, it lost about a third of its um, area to Russia. But it's a lovely place to visit, especially down the market area there. It's really humming here in the summertime. Very, very nice. Welcome to the very historic city of St. Petersburg in Russia. Set on the river Neva here. And over there is the boat called the Aurora, which um, shot a blank that led to the Russian Revolution and then 70 years of communism. So we're sitting here in a very, very historic spot. St. Petersburg, Russia. And right here is the birthplace of Petrograd or St. Petersburg. Peter the Great commissioned this city in 1703 and built a fortress here. And um, that was to keep the Swedes out. But soon it became a uh, prison and now it's a museum. And there are lots and lots of tourists who come here every day. Peter the Great didn't like Moscow, and so he wanted this new city to be more Western, including even the, the cathedral here, the Orthodox Cathedral. And so this is the Cathedral of St. Peter and Paul, in Western style. Peter the Great and other Russian nobility are buried in here. Tsar Nicholas and Alexander, um, who were killed that led in the revolution, even they're buried here. They were exhumed from Siberia and brought back here and, and uh, put to rest in 1998. It's wonderful to be here at the Cathedral of St. Peter and St. Paul because um, I've been interested in the Romanovs and their story for a long time and it's wonderful to come to this place. Right here where yeah. Le um, Leningrad or Petrograd and now St. Petersburg began. Yeah. Now we're in Mars Square and there's the eternal flame which commemorates the revolutionists. And here's the Church of the Saviour of the Spilt Blood. They certainly don't build churches like that in our part of the world. It's 
32 degrees, which is very hot for this particular city. And um, in the winter it gets down to minus 32 degrees or more. Everything freezes over. They get 60, 60 sunny days a year, and we're going to get three in a row all at once. The sun sets uh, for half an hour. So it sets and then half an hour later rises and they don't use street lights because they don't need them um, for about three months of the year. Welcome to St Petersburg. <laughs> Welcome to St Petersburg, yeah. Over there is the fortress of St Peter and St Paul where the city started. And over here is the Hermitage which is the uh, place, the Winter Palace for the Emperors. And between them is the River Neva on the bustling city of St. Petersburg. It's a real privilege to be here. In World War II, 1941 to 1945, 900 days, this whole of Leningrad was closed off. The Germans were trying to, um, to, to take over Leningrad. And they had no food and no water and one million people died. Some of them starved to death and some of them froze to death. Now we're going to go for a cruise on the Neva River to see the sights of the city in the evening. And over there is the fortress and the people are still sunbathing. It's nine o'clock at night. Mr. Vodka should be consumed only with some fruit, so don't you get a piece of banana or apple or anything next to it, because after you drink it, you should put something in your mouth, either like juice or, or apple or, or, or banana or whatever. So, now we're ready for us. We say Nasdaq earlier. Nasdaq earlier, which means to the Now, I'm not a drinker, but when you're in Russia, you should do as the Russians do, so Nasdaqovia. And orange juice, quick. It's a real privilege to be here in St. Petersburg. It's an amazing city, all right? The buildings here really are magnificent. This is the Hermitage, which is uh, Peter's Winter Palace. There's the Alexander Column. You can just get a sense of the scale of uh, this place. The Hermitage is beautifully decorated and the lovely green there. This is the building that Peter said no other building could be as high as this one and that's restricted the height of all buildings here in St. Petersburg. The city's built on a series of canals and islands. All around you, you see these lovely buildings. This is the Kazan Cathedral. Quite a magnificent structure and it's wonderful really that in the revolution under communism they didn't pull down these wonderful old churches. They're still here. And this is the church of the saviour of the spilt blood. Wouldn't have been a tragedy if they'd have um, ruined this place. And this is one of the many churches that the communists um, confiscated from the church and turned into public buildings. It is a museum. Many of them were turned into um, skating rinks or diving, swimming pools and that kind of thing for recreation. And then when communism fell, some of them got returned back to churches. This one is still a public um, museum. And look at the intricacy of the works up here. Pretty amazing, eh? When the buildings were bombed in the war, they uh, replaced them in the same style if they could. But if the buildings were totally destroyed, they replaced them with new ones like this. And you can see this one's even gone a little bit higher than it's supposed to. 
um, and that indicates that this building was actually totally destroyed in the war and has been rebuilt. And sometimes after the war, they added extras on top, and you can see that here. And then when the communists came in, they made some of them take them down. And here we have the church of St. Isaac, and it's the biggest church here in St. Petersburg, and it's actually the fifth biggest in the whole world. Quite impressive, isn't it? And here we have the great man himself, Peter the Great, the founder of this city. Initially Petrograd, then changed to Leningrad, and finally back to St. Petersburg. Thanks Peter for having us. Now we're on Nevsky Prospect, which is the main road, and um, there's a real sense of um, hustling and bustling a modern city. It doesn't feel at all like uh, you're in a communist country. One of the things they have said though is that not very many people smile. And if you do smile, then it means that there's something slightly uh, wrong in you. So uh, we'll have a look and see if the people are smiling. We're now going to have a look around inside Le Hermitage um, and it should be good because this is the second biggest art museum in the world. This palace is really opulent. Everywhere you look there are gold and artworks. The emperors lived here right through to 1917 at the time of the revolution. This room celebrates the victory of the Russians over Napoleon in 1812, a la the 1812 overture, and the various um, generals are highlighted. And here's the throne the emperor sat on. Look at this for crystal and gold. And there's the famous peacock clock. And here we have a Leonardo da Vinci. There are beautiful tapestries and paintings. And crystal.
and fine artwork, gold, and clocks. And I didn't think I'd come to Russia to see a Da Vinci, but um, it's wonderful to see it. And this is a copy by Raphael of the same thing in Rome. And here's Mary and Joseph, the baby Jesus, again by Raphael. It's amazing to stand so close to a, a Rembrandt, but it's really sad that you have to whiz past so many of them. We just don't have time to appreciate them, but wow, amazing. And here we have Michelangelo's Crouching Boy. Now your name's Catherine, isn't it? Yeah. Um, when Catherine the Great lived here, she wouldn't let anyone but her in to see all these amazing artworks. Now isn't that something? Well, it sure is. Yeah. Pretty selfish. <laughs> It's absolutely amazing. What do you reckon about this place? Well, you can, the power you have when you're an empress. Or empress. Yeah. It's all a bit overwhelming. There's just sensory overload. Up there is... Catherine the Great, who uh, started this whole thing, and um, all the artworks have been paid for by aristocrats, by the nobility, by the emperors, but uh, they got the money from the peasants. And then after the revolution, um, all artworks from throughout the country were brought here into one place. Some of the pieces, in particular the Renoir and the Monet that they have, was actually stolen during World War and they brought them here and um, the Russians have said they'll give them back when they give them back their own treasures so um, they're here to stay I think. You steal from me, I'll steal from you. <laughs> this is The Descent from the Cross by Rembrandt, a world famous masterpiece, one of many many here. And here's Rembrandt's um, prodigal son. The masterpieces just go on and on to come to a place like this it's incredible and I've decided that I really love Renaissance art because I'm a Renaissance woman and I <laughs> wrapped in a diet coat world <laughs> and it reflects uh, so much of the, um, the beauty around us it's just wonderful you're beautiful yeah, <laughs> yeah I wasn't really expecting um this palace to be quite what it is. It's actually just an amazing art museum, second biggest in the world after La Louvre in Paris. And a real privilege to come here. Fantastic. Now we're going into the Cathedral of St. Peter and Paul, where Peter the Great and Tsar Nicholas and his wife are buried. The cathedral is yet another beautiful building. They really know how to decorate their buildings. And here we have the tomb of Peter the Great. There he is. And this is his wife, Catherine I, and his daughter, Elizabeth. Quite a spectacular resting place, isn't it, for him?
And here we have the tomb of Tsar Nicholas and his wife Alexandra and their children. And they were deposed in the Russian Revolution um, and sent to Siberia where they died. But their uh, bodies were exhumed in 1998 and brought back here and buried in this special tomb. When Nicholas and Alexandra and their four children and some servants were killed, um, the, they read out, they came in into a room and started to read out saying they were going to be condemned and then Nicholas stood up to say what and they shot them. The women had corsets which they'd sewn jewels inside of and so they ricocheted and they didn't die so the, um, the women were killed with bayonets. It's all very sad and then they were taken and put down a, a deep cavern, two different cabins and left down there for 80 years until they were found and brought back here for burial. This is the cross that they use in Russian Orthodox churches, the normal cross, and then up the top there shows the sign that was above Jesus' head when he was buried, and this little bit here is for where he put his feet. This was a pretty horrible period of history for Russia, but it's nice that they have um, finally recognize the contribution that these people have made to history in this amazing place. Now we're going to visit the palace of Catherine the Great. Um, this is the summer palace of the Romanov family, the emperors, the Tsars, and yet another amazing building. The Germans pretty much destroyed this place in the Second World War, and it's been painstakingly restored. It took about 30 years to do it. This is the ballroom of Catherine's palace and there's lots of gold and look at the roof. Catherine the Great was Peter the Great's grandson's wife. Peter the Third married Catherine and she obviously had pretty good taste because uh, this palace was decorated according to her needs. Peter the third, that's Catherine's husband, he only reigned for six months because Catherine organised a coup and had him killed. And then she reigned here for 34 years. And here we have the dining room. The tables are all in the shape of a letter of the alphabet. Catherine the Great loved collecting things. This, she loved porcelain. This is one of her dining sets. And they reckon she had 30,000 dresses. And here she is, the great woman herself, in one of her special dresses. And here's the actual dress. Obviously, some lady. And this is the famous Amber Room, which is called the Eighth Wonder of the World. All the walls are made of amber. And here she is again, the great woman, Catherine the Great. And here's her favorite grandson, Alexander. He's the one that defeated Napoleon. 
When the war broke out, they uh, photographed all of the place and they sent off treasures to Siberia and they sent off the um, plans so that they were able to restore the place afterwards. Here's what it was like before the war and here's what it was like afterwards. The Nazis bombed the place and set it on fire. Restoration started in 1960 and took about 30 years. Must have been a really painstaking job. This is not only a monument to Catherine, really. Um, it's, a, it's a monument to the fortitude and strength of Russian people as a whole to pick themselves up after all of this is destroyed and the whole of um, Leningrad or St. Petersburg being um, under siege for so long and yet here they are back again and able to, to do that and I think it's a tribute to that as well as to um, Catherine herself. Yes we've seen some pretty impressive buildings while we've been in Russia and St. Petersburg and this one is right up there with it. The amount of gold in this building is just incredible. So this is um, Catherine the Great's Palace, St. Petersburg, Russia. And what a lovely way to finish this amazing visit to St. Petersburg, Russia. Now we're in Tallinn in Estonia and uh, this is where they have a big song festival. Tallinn's right next door to Russia and um, have a big demonstration here and the whole population of the place turned out. Over there's the old city and you can see the ship that we're going on tonight to uh, Sweden and uh, it seems that here in Estonia they don't like Russians very much. So far all we've heard about is how horrible Russians are. <laughs> but they do like music and it's a good thing. Yeah, Gustav, he likes to watch the music and he writes music for the 25,000 member choir. Tallinn is on the Baltic Sea and it's quite a long way oh. from the nearest la uh, water mass so there's not much salt in the sea. It's sort of like the opposite of the Dead Sea in Israel where it's very salty. Here, it's very unsalty. And over there's the old town. We're now in Tallinn's uh, old town and here we have the parliament, come palace, come fortress. In the last um, hundred years they've had nine different rulers over this place. And they've got a beautiful Orthodox Church, but almost nobody in this country um, goes to church. The old town's surrounded by uh, walls and towers. Great group, really. <laughs> what a fine bunch of tourists. <laughs> One of the towers. This is the uh, old Hanseatic town and it's been a place of trade for the last 600 years. A Hanseatic town is sort of like a, a grouping of towns in different countries that um, trade together, sort of like an early version of the EEC which is a grouping of countries. And what a lovely um, market we've got here in the Hanseatic town. And there's the town hall 
and yet another market. Got a lovely flavour to it, this place. Tallinn in Estonia. And in here we have the world's oldest pharmacy. It was opened in 1422 and it's still open today. It has a small population, Estonia, and it had a very um, unhappy and unstable past. And it's lovely to come here and see that they're actually happy now and they're building their lives. They do not like Russians, but they're, um, and, and you can see why. Um, but they're making a, a, a good go of turning the country around and enjoying their life here. Yes, and now this place is really buzzing. It's got a, so much life about it. It's lovely to see. You can buy amber here. And all sorts of other lovely things. And so we say farewell to Tallinn in Estonia, a very nice place to visit. And now we're back in Stockholm and today we're going to go right across Sweden into Norway. Now we're on the border between Norway on the left and Sweden on the right. And this is the first demilitarized border ever in the world in 1914. So here we are, welcome to Norway. Norway. I'm here, Grandad. I arrived. I made it. <laughs> yes. And go back to Sweden. Well done. I'm a Norwegian. And one of the main reasons why we chose this particular tour is because it comes to Norway. And we wanted to come to Norway because my granddad, Harold Oscar Anderson, was born here. And we've come to follow um, and discover where he lived and um, search for some roots. This monument is symbolic of uh, the two nations being friends rather than enemies. Except that the prices in Norway are so much more expensive than in Sweden, so the Norwegians come over to Sweden to shop. Norway is a very picturesque place with lots of lovely lakes and we're going to see the fjords. Over there is Lillehammer where they held the uh, 94 Winter Olympics. This was the site of the uh, opening ceremony for the Winter Olympics and they can still ski here today. It's great that we're here in uh, the summertime because normally of course this is all snowed over. Beautiful. Oh, it's gorgeous up there. But it was hard work when you walk down part way and walk back up again um, because it's high and um, maybe the air's thinner but it was hard work on the old heart. <laughs> it was great good. mountaineer you. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. It's certainly set in a very picturesque environment. Here's a typical Norwegian country church. If you look at the houses nearby, you'll see they're all painted in this brown colour. And this church is particularly special because some British um, soldiers combined with the Norwegian to try and stave off the um, Germans in World War II and um, were killed here and so they've created a memorial in memory of those who died. And a special feature is growing of plants on the top of the roofs. And they have lovely painted letter boxes. What a lovely place. 
now we're in the village of Loam, and this is a stave church that dates back 800 years. And you can see that back in those days they didn't just have Christian symbolism, there's all sorts of other religious stuff going on here as well. There's evidence of glaciation everywhere. You can see the uh, milky coloured water, the uh, slopes of the hills, the ice. All this area was covered by ice 10,000 years ago and it's gradually lifting up out of, the, um, out of the ground as the weight of the ice has been released. Quite spectacular scenery. Look to the left, that's where we're going. Here. <laughs> well done! <laughs> Down there is Giranga, where we're going to. And here we have the Giranga Fjord, the beautiful village of Giranga. The fjord is 16 kilometers long and it's part of a longer fjord that is 100 kilometers long. How beautiful, eh? Gearinga is a mecca for the tourist ships. They come in in the morning, discharge all the people, they go and look around, then they, the tourists head back to the boat and off they go in the evening. This is one of Norway's major tourist attractions and you can certainly see why. It's easy to see how the Fjord has been carved out of the uh, rock by a glacier. See the two sides of the glacier. So here's the lovely little village of Giranga, Norway. Pretty gorgeous, isn't it? Giranga is a lovely, lovely place. It's a privilege to come here. You can certainly see why this is such a major tourist attraction. We're now leaving Giranga. We're going up the fjord and we're going to Helisilt. Unfortunately the weather has packed up and so it's raining but it's still beautiful and with the mist and the clouds. It does mean we get some pretty spectacular scenery though. And here we have the famous Seven Sisters waterfall. Quite spectacular. I reckon it's even better with the mist. Lovely. Quite majestic. And so we leave Giranga Fjord in Norway. We're heading forward through the fjords, going to the next one. This one's called Nord Fjord. And you can start to see now that there's farming on the slopes above the fjord. Now remember how I was telling you that all of this country is formed by glaciation. Well this is the Sognal Glacier and it is the biggest glacier in Europe. 
very hard to describe the scale here. It is just so big. It's all a little bit overwhelming. Just magnificent. How about that? And the glacier feeds into the Sonja Fjord, which is the biggest fjord in Norway, going about 150, 200 kilometers from here out to the sea. Our hotel in Leikanga is actually right on the Sonja Ford. So uh, we get some lovely views from the hotel. On average, the fjord is about a kilometre deep, and here it's about four kilometres across. Now we're going to go and look at a farm, a typical Norwegian farm, and in this case, it's uh, all these buildings here are from six farmlets that work together uh, cooperatively. And on this particular farm, they have Viking burial grounds, and um, they can tell they have this dip in the top and. They have been plundered many, many, many times, so there is nothing um, valuable under there, and probably no bodies, but um, they've got about four or five of them just in this little piece of land. Now, Norway is the uh, country of the trolls, and over there are the billy goats gruff. On their farms they grow apples and pears and plums and berries and they also run a few uh, sheep. And it's all set alongside the fjord. And here we have the barn and uh, have about 50 sheep and they live for six months in the winter in there. Then they come out and they are grazed and brought back in when it gets cold again. Very important here is firewood, and this uh, shed is filled up with firewood to keep everybody warm in the winter. So his name is Sambo. Sambo. And what does Sambo do? Uh, Sambo, he's a sheepdog, uh, so he gathers the sheep uh, in the field or up in the mountains when we're get, collecting them, to count them, or to get them from the mountain. Cider made of apple and pears made on the property. So, Skol. Skol, which means drink. This is a quite different kind of farming to what we're used to. The animals from the community go away altogether, and it's only on about half a hectare. The uh, plants are all grown on the hillsides far away from here, and then everything's brought back. Um, for processing. But the main thing is that the government subsidises the farms by about 50%. None of them are, are profitable in, in themselves, so they're all looking for other ways of making income. A very interesting insight into a different kind of farming. On our journey through Norway, we go through 400 tunnels. That's because the countryside is so mountainous. Now we're in the Leerdal Road Tunnel and this is the longest tunnel in the world. It cost $2 billion to make, took five years and it's 24.5 kilometres long. They even provide little rooms so you can have a break so you don't get tired and go to sleep as you're driving through. We're also going on this ferry across the fjord so that we can then go on to the famous Norway in a nutshell Florm Railway. The transport systems here are really efficient given the kind of environment in Norway. Now we're going on the Florm Railway. It's 20 kilometers of scenic journey, steepest railway in the world. Uh, it took 20 years to make because in that uh, 20 years it was all made by hand. 
The Floor Railway rises 888 metres above the sea, over 20 kilometres. We pass through some pretty beautiful countryside. There are fantastic waterfalls and little villages. And beautiful valleys. And look at that for a road. And the train stops halfway so that you can see this. Quite a fantastic waterfall. And there are one or two people here enjoying the show. The scenery changes all the time. Lots of different scenery in this train journey. Perhaps that's why they call it Norway in a nutshell. And now we're going on another railway. This time to Voss. The scenery is different now, but it is still pretty wonderful. Now we're coming into the city of Voss. Well, here we are in Voss, and my name is Voss. Hello, Voss. Um, yeah, and this is a lovely uh, country town set on a lovely lake. And here's the first stone church in Norway and it was built in 1277. Now we're heading towards Yelo up in the mountains and you get these beautiful waterfalls all through the, the uh, mountains of Norway. And this is what it's like underneath a waterfall. And the tourist business is alive and well in Norway as well. Now we're on the Hardinger Fjord and we're heading up into the mountains towards Yalo. Look at those clouds up there. The whole thing is just so awe-inspiring and beautiful. Quaint little township. And this is the very end of the Hardinger Fjord and there's a whole busload of Trafalgar tourists who are very pleased to be here because one of the roads over there got um, blocked so we had to do a great big diversion around the fjord and now we finally made it here so we can head off towards Kialo. Yalo is a ski resort and um, it's right up in the mountains, about halfway between Bergen and Oslo. Up there you can see the ski slopes. We're not staying here, this is just a stop off as we head for the capital of Norway. Now we're in Bergen, the second biggest city in Norway. And over there is the old quarter, the um, Hanseatic quarter. And you can see up in the uh, skyline there the funicular that takes you up to the top so you can get a good view of the city. And here we have Edvard Grieg. Norway's famous composer and I can assure you that the music that you are hearing in the background is not Edvard Grieg's. 
And here we have the fish market. Bergen's very much a port. You can buy all sorts of fish here. You can get whale. And look at the size of the salmon. And prawns of every kind of variety. And here's the uh, Brugge and the Hanseatic um, buildings that have been used for trade for many, many years. In fact, they, uh, those old ones over there, which are Bergen signature buildings, burnt down in the 1700s, so they've had to be rebuilt. And I hope that doesn't mean that they're burning down again today. You can imagine trade taking place here over the centuries. Um, we saw this kind of thing, uh, uh, Hanseatic uh, buildings in Tallinn. See how these ones aren't very straight up and down. Their foundations uh, are a bit weak. And if you look carefully, you can actually see the different buildings that are on a slant and um, over the many hundreds of years have moved around backwards and forwards. The Brigan here in Bergen is a World Heritage Site. And the people are just flocking here to enjoy the old ambience of this place. Now we're going on the cable car, funicular, right up to see the views of Bergen City. Quite special, isn't it? Well, the cable car runs on the same system as the Wellington one. One goes up, the other goes down. Seven minutes worth of it. When you get up, this is what you see. And I hadn't quite cottoned on to the fact that Bergen has this little peninsula but sticking out of the middle of it and there's water on either side. It's quite an interestingly set out city. And there's the peninsula and the sights of the city. Bergen's really humming. There are people just everywhere. This monument um, explains some of the history of the place from the Vikings to the Christians coming in to modern Bergen. Well, Bergen's been a bit of a revelation. It's a big, modern, bustling city. But it's also got lots and lots of history and lots and lots of tourists too. It's a great place to visit. Okay, well, uh, it's the last day of the tour today. We're heading up to Oslo. We'll be finishing our 18-day tour of Scandinavia and Russia. I think we had all a very good time. It was a successful tour. I didn't have to go to any hospital, any police station. And uh, I hope everybody enjoyed themselves and had a wonderful time with us. So I hope I'll see many of you again in the future. And now welcome to Oslo, the capital of Norway and its biggest city. This is City Hall, and it's here that they give out the Nobel Peace Prizes. And there's one of the biggest clocks you're going to see ever. Over there is King Harald, the Viking king who founded Norway. And here's Olaf, the country's first saint. And once again, the city centre is buzzing with life. It's here on the Oslo Fjord. And there are tourist uh, opportunities abounding. This is the new opera house. It was built just two years ago and it's the jewel in their crown. They love it here in Oslo. And it is resembling an iceberg going into the sea. Yes, you can see why they like it so much. It's a pretty unique building. 
and here we are at the Vigaland Sculpture Park, the biggest sculpture park in the world, and it explores human relationships. Now, um, all of the sculptures are in the nude, so be warned. The sculptures all tell a story. Here we've got birth through childhood and then puberty. Next comes youth, where you fall in love and have a few trials and tribulations. Then comes adulthood, when you have babies and various problems that come along the way, being an adult. And next is old age, where you take on the joys of grandparenting. And finally, death. And here's the most popular uh, statue in the whole collection, and it's called the Angry Boy. And this one is Vigaland himself with his beloved grandfather. He designed all of the statues himself. It took him 40 years from 1903 to 1943. The sad thing was that he himself, he was married, had two children and didn't have much time for his own children and when he divorced he had nothing else to do with his own children. But they believe he must have loved his grandfather. Sad, eh, when he's uh, created all this which is about the cycle of human life. He must have had quite an imagination to conceive this place. And here we have the palace, the royal palace, where the king and queen and their family live. The king's name is Hanel and the queen's name is Sonia. And here in Norway, everyone seems to love their king and queen. And here we have the parliament. Oslo is another city that's got a lovely feel about it, especially in the summertime. These ponds ice over and if we were here in the winter, they'd be uh, skating on them. Now we're in the Arkashus Fortress that was built by King Christian in the 1500s. Um, in the early days of um, Oslo's formation. Some pretty impregnable uh, defences here in the fortress. And it overlooks the modern city of Oslo. Well, we've come a long way. It seems a long time ago that we were in Copenhagen, but it's a beautiful, beautiful country. And then we got to see Sweden and Finland, and then there was St. Petersburg, which I think was a highlight and a bit of a surprise from the, the beauty of the place. The people, not quite so sure about that. Um, and Estonia, not knowing anything about Estonia at all and learning about that was wonderful. And then swooping ourselves back through here and spending these eight days in Norway, it has been um, wonderful. It's a beautiful country, lots of natural um, landscape and beautiful, kind, polite people and um, they stop for you across pedestrian crossings and the way in which they treat you in every situation. It's been a wonderful tour. Yes, it has been a wonderful tour. Um, we've, we've gone with a nice bunch of people from America, from Canada and from Australia. Great tour guide, great uh, bus driver. We've seen old sites and we've seen new sites. We've uh, visited cities, we've seen the uh, countryside and um, probably for me the highlight has been coming to Norway oh, I suppose it was St Petersburg was wonderful but coming to Norway and seeing the majesty of the mountains of the uh, glaciers of the lakes of the rivers just beautiful this is a wonderful country and it's been a wonderful wonderful experience visiting these different countries in Scandinavia Russia and Estonia